Welcome to Cheaper Than Therapy, a podcast that journeys into conversations with the intention of demystifying, destigmatizing, and desensitizing what really gets talked about behind the closed doors of the therapy room. I'm Vanessa Bennett. And I'm Danae Selkin. And we're seekers, soul sisters, and holders of sacred space. So join us as we dive into the ways that therapy can be connecting not only to yourself, but also to those around you. So for today's episode, we are doing something a little bit different. We pressed record on a conversation that we were having just as friends. We were talking with Vanessa's baby daddy, John Mm -hmm. Kim, also known as the angry therapist. And we're talking a little bit about this moment that we are in with social distancing and everything that's happening with COVID-19. Just talking about how we think that things are going to shift in terms of our relationships, how dating is going to be in a moment where we're actually not able to get together with people in person. And we thought it was interesting and this might be something that could bring some value to someone else. So we decided to record our conversation. He has all this amazing advice to give people who are dating and working through things in their relationship. But today and I were like, yeah, but what about what the hell is going on right now, right? And also like generationally, how is that going to be different? How is that going to manifest? So we just took this opportunity to pick his brain and, you know, forgive us if it's a little kind of off the cuff because we are all friends. And it was also like, I don't know, eight o'clock at night and I had just put my newborn down and my brain was falling out of my ears. So it might Lots be Lots of the giggles <laughs> in between. Yeah. Right. But we still thought it was kind of a good conversation to bring to you guys and hopefully it'll be helpful. So Enjoy. We have a special guest, my man, John Kim, the angry therapist, sitting next to me as we speak. And we actually wanted to bring him in to have a little conversation as kind of the the dating expert that he is, the dating guru. First, I want to say, when you say my man, it implies implies ownership. And I just want to say, (laughs) you you don't own me. (laughs) You don't own me. Um, Do you prefer baby daddy, John? Baby daddy's kind of cool. That's okay, kind of so sexy. my baby daddy. And actually, we should, we should quickly say that there's a sleeping baby in the other room and a monitor behind me. So if at any point you hear a scream and I disappear, that's why. <laughs> John. Yes. Um, so let's talk about the dating landscape and how it's being Im- impacted by the virus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you've seen anything, I mean, I'm curious to know from your perspective on your social media, you know, and in your line of work, if you've seen kind of people asking questions specific to what's going on right now around dating? Yeah, I think this is actually really great for swipe culture. It's going to shape, shake the dating etch sketch It's going to clear mm. the canvas because we're thirsty for a connection and yet we can't physically meet. And so there's going to be no ghosting. There's going to be actual intention and effort to actually uh, get to know someone, I think. Before this hit, you know, you, you usually meet someone, you swipe on their face, you meet them at a coffee shop, you know, and it's like a checklist of, if, of you know, if they're for you or not. And so it's almost like a, an interview, um, mm-hmm. an evaluation for like five minutes. And then if you're not feeling it you, while they're in a the restroom, you're looking for someone else. So yeah. I think that uh, this, this virus and the, the world on pause for dating, I think is, is actually really good for us. Yeah. What are you, what are you noticing is coming up for people generally around, like you just described it as the world on pause. Like, what are you noticing the conversation and the collective is right now? Well, I think the air in the room is connection. So mm. if you apply that to dating, instead of a disconnection, I think it's going to be uh, more effort to get to know someone to actually show up via, via, you know, whether it's video or phone to actually engage with people. I think there's more chance of that happening now with the virus than before. It feels like people are hungry for authentic connection in a way that they weren't maybe before. I just put down an article where they were talking about how divorce is skyrocketing and people are like on the verge of divorce in China, like really high numbers because people have been sort of locked together in small spaces that were sort of coasting, um, maybe working a lot. And now they're sort of, really you know looking at their relationship through a different lens and realizing yes. this is um, what they want. I think that's happening. So I think whenever you're forced to 
uh, sit with yourself, uh, shit's going to come up, right? And mm. so before the virus, we're able to escape our relationships and, um, you know, go busy, go be busy somewhere else. Or, or, or now that we can't leave the house, our house or apartment is turned into a pressure cooker in a way. I think it puts a black light on a relationship. And I think this is either going to harden us or soften us, you know, and I don't mean soften in a, in a weak way, but in a uh, looking inward, having revelations, you know, uh, an evaluation of life way. You know, this made me think of, maybe this is, um, this is definitely kind of off the topic of dating a little bit, but when we guys were talking about connection, I was just thinking about how yesterday I was walking around the neighborhood with the baby in the carrier and, you know, it's LA, right? You're used to seeing people everywhere and it's total ghost town right now, which is bizarre. And I walked by this elderly man outside and he, um, he said, so we started talking and, um, uh, broken English, but it was really sweet. And I, and I found myself, you know, we were standing obviously like six feet apart, but I found myself almost like really like, Oh, this, this new person and mm. this connection. And I was so into this conversation that him and I were having. And as I walked away, after we talked for a little while, I thought, Oh my God, I haven't been this like hungry for connection outside of, you know, us, like people in our house in a really long time. And I'm wondering too, not just even in dating, but I'm also wondering how this is going to almost reset that connection at like a human to human soul to soul level too. Just, mm. you know, I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. I think people are thirsty for engagement, human, human connection. And, and Danae, like you said, more authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think also with this, there's an evaluation of your life. Like you're going to start mm. shuffling your, your life cards and, and, and ask yourself what's really important, who's really important. So there's going to be less tolerance. And I think why there's so much divorce is it's a combination of both. It's like, being trapped where you're forced to, to sit with each other so all the problems come up and then not being able to escape from that to actually have to face that and then less tolerance right yeah. and so i think that's that's kind of happening and i think it's going to continue to happen after you know like the cat's out of the bag mm -hmm. yeah i feel like when i think of you john that's so much of what i think of what i think you really sort of inspire people to do is to really get in to comfort with that space of being with yourself in that way. You know, I recently gone through a separation and I know you're, you just finished your second book, Single on Purpose, right? It's done. I thought you were going to say you just finished your second separation. I was like, no, we're, we're still together. <laughs> hey, we're still together. She's sitting right next to you. You've been, you've been in close quarters with a baby. It's over, right? I was like, all right, is there something I don't know? Is it, is this an intervention? What is going on? Yeah, but I just, I, I feel like, I'd love to talk about that idea of how sometimes, whether it's a breakup or whether it's like being in these moments where you realize your relationship isn't working can sort of be this catalyst. Because I feel like you always speak of for you really doing the inner work that maybe you haven't been, I don't want to say like willing to do, but maybe you haven't had the reason to do or the opportunity to do before. And how, you know, I think there's such a negative connotation that comes with being alone and all of a sudden like being uncoupled and I love the way that you know I like right after my separation um, you guys know but I had dinner with the two of you and I remember you John talking to me about what an opportunity it was for you after your divorce to really go inward and get to know yourself and build like these deeper relationships and friendships and it really just sort of helped me reframe the way that I held being alone yeah mm -hmm which was such a gift to me in a moment when I was like, whoa, this is, you know, really different than what I thought my life was, the outcome of my life was going to look like. But it, I think that's really useful to sort of, maybe it can be bigger than the context. Yeah, that and, um, I didn't know that when I was going through it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like, I, I, I know that now connecting dots, looking back, right? Um, but when I was going through it, <clears throat> it was horrible. I was lonely. I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't know what to do. All of that stuff, right? And I'll be honest, it's not like I, I went through a divorce and I had all this peace. And I was like, okay, now's the time for me to really work on myself. Mm -hmm. um, there was panic. There was hurt. There was all of that, you know? But I ended up going down that road because uh, my divorce led me to a cul-de-sac, right? My divorce gave me no choice. Now, if I was successful and if I had a lot of, you know, friends and a lot of reasons, uh, ways to escape, I don't think I would have done any inner work. You know, mm. I would have uh, like just went and bought a nice car and started just doing things that produced a lot of dopamine. And, but I didn't, <laughs> I was at a very low point in my life where I didn't have anything. Like I just started blogging. I was just 
in training to become a therapist. So that wasn't, you know, I didn't have any book deals. I didn't have any friends. I just found CrossFit. So like I, I had nowhere else to turn but inward. Mm. I think that's, I think what you said about this idea of not having an escape though, I think that a lot of people right now are going to be able to relate to that, right? Mm. Because a lot of us right now are sitting around going, oh shit, we're staring at each other. We don't have the same escapes, right? Kind of going back to what you were saying about in China and the divorce rate. You're right. That going inward for many people comes when you have nowhere else to go or nowhere else to turn but inward. It's almost like the last resort. And and not everybody does that, right? I mean, it's that whole um, evolve or die. I mean, not to be melodramatic, but a lot of people will choose kind of the death, right? They will choose to do the opposite. They'll choose the drink. They'll choose whatever that other thing is rather than do the evolution. And I think right now, I'm, I'm curious to see the kind of fallout of this, but I, I think a lot of people are going to be forced to to evolve. Well, l- let me ask you guys this, you know, and maybe some the people are listening, some of them may be wondering what does even going inward look like? Cuz mm. you know it's different for every every everyone. So yeah. like my inward may be different than, you know, um Danae's inward, yeah. right? And or or Vanessa's. I don't know how Vanessa has gone inward yet, but when she does, you know, <laughs> it's look very different. But <laughs> What what does this is going on? I'm doing this with you guys. So like a lot it. of people, they're gonna be like, this shit's psycho babble, and they talk all this mm. stuff about going inward. What um let, you know, and I, I let's bring it to street level. What does going inward look like? Yeah, I love that question. For me, going inward meant starting to really try to understand what a relationship with myself looked like. And mm. when was the mm. last time I really felt that, right? Like when was I aware of the things that I loved for myself. Like I, you know, I got separated and I realized I have been partnered since I was like 18 years old, you know, like pretty like consistently. So I don't really know what it is to, I don't know, live life doing the things that I love to do, making a decision about dinner because this is what I want for dinner, Mm -hmm. decorating my house according to my taste and not our taste. Right. So just, I feel like it's been really kind of exciting to like get to know myself again you know Mm -hmm. I mean you think you're with yourself this whole time but I realized how much being with someone else quite often meant that I really wasn't with myself in a present way Mm. I don't know if that makes sense yeah I think that's pretty profound actually I mean I think this for you I could see how that would be the going inward is almost like the the discovering of who you actually are outside of partnership right and I think if we're answering the question, I guess I'm looking at, I'm thinking back to kind of my, the start of my journey of kind of going in word, quote unquote. And I think for me, it was understanding and learning the patterns that were kind of the puppet strings that Mm. I didn't know were the puppet strings. So meaning we say, if I can explain this, even though it's 830 and my brain is fried, Meaning the patterns in my life or the way that I was wired were kind of the puppeteers, right? And I I didn't have as much control over who I was and how I showed up as I thought I was. So going inward for me meant untangling a lot of those kind of puppet strings and starting to take back the control and unfortunately, unfortunately, the responsibility of how I acted and how I showed up. So for me, it was a very kind of like cold shower, look in the mirror and, and kind of, yeah, taking responsibility, I think, for some of that stuff. Yeah, so I hear Danae saying going inward means establishing a relationship with herself, uh, mm-hmm. liking herself. Who is who? Who am I? What do I like? You know, all of that. Um, putting action behind that, mm-hmm. and then for Vanessa, I hear uh, going inward means taking ownership, right? Mm-hmm. So th- those are very different, but but they overlap, of course, yeah. right? I and mean, I think those are, are big pieces in anyone's rebirth is because if you don't take ownership then you know there's no growth right Mm -hmm. and then if you don't actually establish a healthy relationship with yourself or at least begin to then you're just doing a lot of activities yeah and it's so interesting as you say that i feel like you know my going inward feels a little bit like the first step right like sitting and tolerating the discomfort of all of a sudden i'm by myself so how do i stay here in this space without a choice, right? How do I not um, have a release valve? How do I not do whatever I need to do to escape this feeling of aloneness? So how can I sort of start to cultivate the things I like? What I love about what you said, Vanessa, is it feels like it's that next step, right? Like Mm -hmm. I start to bring some understanding of what have been my patterns? What were my patterns in my relationship? You know, I think what has been so powerful for both me 
and my husband that I'm separated from is that we have both had this opportunity to have real conversations about what were our patterns from our childhood that sort of made us the perfect storm of finding each other like with so much compassion for ourselves and one another and like this is what we were attempting to heal this is what was going on this was the version of the parent that you were that I was sort of like acting out trying to heal that hurt in this relationship and I think that a little bit that's what I feel like I hear you speaking to yeah well, and that's so interesting because you and I have talked before on on this and just in, with us, I mean, the differences in us and the similarities in us, you know, I don't want to chalk it up to black and white, like introvert, extrovert, whatever. But I mean, I think that for me, the sitting with myself, like as somebody who I was alone and single for large chunks of time. So like I was single in my twenties for like five plus years. Right. And I loved every second of it. Like I didn't, I didn't need or desire to be in partnership, but that wasn't my work to do or my journey to do it. I'm different than you are. Right. So I can, I feel like you and I, in that sense, of course, it's going to be different. It's going to look different what going inward is. Right. You too, John, like it's going to look different based on, you know, who you were, who you are, what your upbringing is, all the all the Legos, I guess, that go into it. Yes. And then, you know, bringing it back to dating, I'm hoping that uh, this this is actually rolling into people who are single, that they are now dating with intention, mm -hmm. uh, dating with, you know, um, this, this, this idea of going inward. And, you know, for, for some people, it might be very subtle. It might not be like, you know, the, going through a hero's journey, right. you know, like yeah. we all did. Right. But, but that's great. I mean, at least that's um, a step, you know, away from dick pics and, yeah. and <laughs> ghosting and getting catfish and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that the coronavirus, and this is my, my choice to look at it this way, I, I believe that it's here to humanize us. Mm -hmm. It's here to remind us of things, you know, and the people that don't want to look at it or listen to it, it's going to harden them. Right. The people that actually do um, have the ability and tools to sit with this and to look inward and to, you know, uh, create the space for revelations and let things go and all of that, they're going to soften. And by, by soften, I mean, they're, they're going to stretch their hearts. They're going to evolve. They're going to um, come out of this, I think, a more authentic person. Mm -hmm. And what would hardening look like? you think like how uh, do you think people will defend against that if they do yeah i think it's reactions it's denial it's resistance it's you know when i see a hardening i think you know an iron fist i think it's by me not through me right mm -hmm. even victim mode can be hardening mm -hmm. right oh this is happening to me it always happens to me being mad at the world all of that stuff this is unfair and i think by me and to me they're both states that put you in in um, lower frequencies panic mm -hmm. fight or flight all of that and then for me, which you, what you're talking about, like who is Danae? What does she deserve? You know, what does she want? That's a for me stage. And then ultimately through me, those are very empowering states. And so I think that's like the cutoff. There's going to be people who are victim or iron fist, you know, mm -hmm. like either victim mode or, you know, fuck this. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go outside and party or whatever. Go to spring break. Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> it, it's going to be for me or through me. And those people are going to... Um, soften and grow up through this. Yeah. Do you feel like that is an understanding that you came to through when I'm, how am I trying to ask this? Like, I don't feel like that is what we learned in school. Like, does that feel like your own understanding after watching and working with clients for so long, John? Yeah. I don't talk about anything I learned in school because I, I, <laughs> I, um, I didn't have the same school experience as you guys did. You know, my education was in a, a, a like a conference room in Encino that was just overpriced and very detached. And yeah. I got my master's very fast. Right. So it was almost like, I'm not going to say the school so I could talk shit about it. Um, <laughs> they were just popping people out and getting the 60 grand per head. I didn't start learning about stuff until I went on my own self journey. Mm -hmm. And then also working in things like nonprofit, running um, groups, spearhead addiction. Like it was actually the, the 3000 hours, you know? Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah. And the school was just kind of, um, it was kind of a joke. So here's what I'll say. One thing that I'm noticing about this is that there's a difference that I've seen anyway in the younger generation or younger population and how they're approaching. So this is what made me think of it when you said spring break, right? The kind of joke has been 
not really funny joke has been like all you young people like stay the fuck home right like this is serious take this seriously and we've seen a lot of them not taking it seriously and I don't know if that's gonna change or if that has changed or if their mentality run has changed but I'm curious to know if there's any overlap you think with dating in that like do we think that 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 age group is going to take this seriously enough where it really will be a catalyst for them or do we see this being like an older older person thing does that make sense yeah, I don't know if at 26 you have the the patience and tools and, and, and actually the desire to look inward. I know I didn't at yeah. 26, you know. I was what, 25. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's the beginning of a, a journey. Yeah. I didn't even start my process until probably uh, 35, 37, you know. Yeah. And also, <laughs> I'm, I'm still on it, you know. We're, sure. we're, we're, it's, it's not oh, like sorry. it's over. Looking inward is a practice. Some days it's hard, some days it's easy. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny how layered it is. And to your point, like always evolving, you know, you, you get to that point where you're like, yes, this is the understanding that I have. And then life comes in to show you how little of an understanding. I'm curious for the two of you, you know, given everything that you may have thought you understood about life, how much of a curveball has my new baby been? Because I feel like I've certainly seen, you know, just in witnessing my friend Vanessa, how different you feel to me since becoming a mom. But I'm curious, like, what feels different in terms of, like, your self-awareness, in terms of you two as a couple? Like, what's come up that you'd be willing to share about parenthood? Well, I think that, just like he said earlier about anybody being in this situation, you know, there's probably a black light and there's, you know, Mm. there's everybody's on top of each other right now, right? So there's irritability and there's, you know, there's all these things that everybody's going to have to deal with. And I think that a baby and, a, and how that brings lack of sleep and all of the concerns and the anxiety and everything that comes up around that, at least for me, I think has been a struggle, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've talked about that. I think it's kind of broken down a lot of like my, I don't know if it's my defenses, but it's definitely broken down a lot of things about myself that I thought I knew and, and put me in a a place of, a place of panic and unknowing, which for me is really hard, right? Because my go-to and my defense is to be the know-it-all that gets everything done. So to be thrown into that has been very difficult. And that obviously translates into relationship, you know? For me, I mean, there's, there's so many aspects of this, uh, from like, uh, the, the process of, witnessing childbirth that being a metaphor for life and how you know it didn't go as planned uh and also such an appreciation for just women and what they have to go through right like you hear things but until you're actually in the front row seeing it you don't realize all the details like balloons and latching and all these things i didn't know about right and you know bleeding nipples and all that But, yeah. but but actually sitting in the front row and watching it and also th- that affecting your life and how that ripples throughout the day. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So mm. I think I've gained an appreciation for someone who anyone who's a parent, you know, mm. uh, it, gave, it gave me a very kind of um, appreciation, appreciation for also our own parents, mm-hmm. because they probably had less and, and, and it's very easy to judge them. And I would always uh, complain that my, my parents didn't give me any emotional milk and all that. Uh, but they were also poor. And I can't imagine doing what we're doing with less, you know, mm. lots of that. And then also it takes the relationship to the next level. You know, like Vanessa, I got into an argument today. It, 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 it there's less patience. There's mm. more irritable. People are more reactive, all of that stuff. And so it's going to test your relationship. But also I, I think what's, what's good about it is uh, if you could uh, withstand it, if you mm-hmm. could you know, go through it, it's also uh, an, an interesting, it's a very accurate test for the strength of your relationship. That's so funny. You know, I've, I've been struck so many times by how much this time that we're in reminds me of when we had a newborn baby. Mm. And so you guys are kind of in this double whammy where not only are we a little bit in this cocoon where life feels very like different in that you're very removed from the outside world and so like, you know, not connected to what's happening with other people. But there's also this sense of everything is heightened because I'm exhausted, because I'm hormonal, because like, 
you know, there's like constant like jarring to your system of like this newborn that like wakes you up every time you close your eyes and like you're just like in a different like unregulated state emotionally, right? And I was thinking how much that is what it feels like. I keep having conversations with clients right now about conflict that they're in, that it feels like people are reacting based on the fact that this moment is so destabilizing to all of us, right? Like mm -hmm. we've never experienced anything like this. We have so much uncertainty that we've never sat with before. And so how much of this is actually about what we're fighting about? And how much of this is about the fact that we are in this social distancing moment that is really difficult to sit in, you know? And I think that's a lot of what at least I experienced when I had a newborn baby. So I was thinking, wow, you guys are like doing it both double. <laughs> right. It's a layer on top of a layer. Almost. Yeah. I think it's a blessing that it, it, I mean, I think it's a great time to raise an infant, infant and mm. uh, it's the worst time to go into delivery. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I, I was telling someone today, I forgot who, but I feel like Indiana Jones, who grabs a hat before the door, door closes, that we got in just in time, mm -hmm. you know, that mm. we had a baby right before the, the virus hit. So um, Vanessa struggles with FOMO, which she has none of, which is great because no one's, mm. so that's good. Uh, we're so occupied. I don't see distracted. We're so occupied with the baby that what's happening in the outside, we're, we're very aware of it, but it's, it's not hitting us probably as hard. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And being the extrovert that I am, you know, I had a friend drop off like cheesecake last night and leave it by the door and back away. And I opened the door and I was like, I just want to hug you. <laughs> I like, it's so Vanessa hard. ran after the car. And tried, <laughs> tried to jump inside. Please hug me. Tried to jump inside. And I was like, we need breast milk. And so. <laughs> I need to get of this Can thing. I just say. <laughs> When you were telling the story about the man on the street that yeah. you had like contact with, I started to feel this internal panic of like, I... were you six feet away from him? <laughs> what are you doing? And also your internal introvert is like, you were talking to a stranger. Why were you talking to him anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I like asked him his name. I was like, let's do this every week. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know, guys. We're in a crazy time. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious to see how this, like, how the dating landscape changes. I think we're about to see something really shift. Let's give people listening, if they are going through some kind of inner journey or on the fence or if they're going, if they're single, if they're going through an expired relationship, mm -hmm. let's give them some kind of direction or, or, or possible tips to, on, on what to do. I like that. Who's let's? You? <laughs> Are we talking to the expert? I will. <laughs> you're, you're the I mean, we have the angry therapist here, so. I, well, I, first, I, I really believe that the expiration of a relationship, a divorce, whatever, creates the richest soil for growth. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this at the time, but looking back, I realized that's, that was the opportunity. And, and I'm glad that I was forced to take it. And if you don't do anything, so if you decide to not do anything, go on no journey, but just cope through whether it's food, sex, drugs, whatever it is to escape, you're going to miss out on like the richest soil to, to plant something amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. So that would be my first thing. And then second, Going inward is different for everyone, and uh, whether it means taking ownership or establishing a better relationship with yourself, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be unique to the individual, right? So it may not be obviously going to Italy or buying a motorcycle or you know whatever it looks like to you. For me, it was mm -hmm. a lot of fitness. It was buying a motorcycle. It was having crepes with guy friends and talking about things that I never did because of mm -hmm. locker rooms. It was spending a lot of time in diners by myself. Uh, and it was a lot of blogging, a lot of journaling mm -hmm. that I just, you know, hit post on. So mm -hmm. that was my journey. But that doesn't mean that, that you know, that's obviously the standard. Uh, but I think what's important is you go on one. And I think when you find someone that, that you want to invest in, you're going to bring so much more to the table. Was that scary for you, John, being open to meeting someone again? It wasn't scary. 
I, I, you know, I, I, I was single for like four or five years after my divorce. I, I went through a, a long stretch of just being alone. And it wasn't even like on purpose. I just couldn't get anyone. <laughs> I tried Craigslist. I tried all the no one was interested. Uh, um, no, I, 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 uh, I actually spent like a long time, probably four years. I mean, I might have went on a date or two, but nothing serious. So mm-hmm. by the time that uh, I, I, I met someone that I wanted to invest in, it, it, I was ready. I was ready. Like I was, I wanted to, to, you know, give relationships a shot again. What do you think people misunderstand about being single? Like what is the societal like misunderstanding about it? The difference between solitude and, and, and loneliness, maybe, mm. you know, uh, I think the world paints single as uh, incomplete. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I need to set you up. There's a ticking clock. Where's your person? I need yes. to find the one. Mm-hmm. But being single, so with the words, when I think about solitude, I think about peace. I mm-hmm. think about wholeness. I think about, you know, nutrients. I think about uh, completion. Like I think about all these other things that uh, is harder to do when you're in a relationship. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think when you're single, it's the, again, it's the best time to go on some kind of inner journey. You know, you may not have the time when you find someone and here's the thing, you're going to find someone and you don't know when that's going to happen. If that happens tomorrow, now, now it's like, oh shit, I should have, I should have <laughs> done this, I should have done that, I, you know, I should have learned yeah. to play the guitar, I should have, you know, and I think it's a great runway. So uh, when you do find someone, you know, those tracks are already laid because when we find love, you know, when, when love hits, we, 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 we all like get into routine. We, you know, spend less time on, time on ourselves. We are in a healthy way, dependent on other people, like all that stuff, you know, so it prevents you. Yeah. I was thinking I had a client, this is part of a a thought of mine, this client that was doing the inner work, but the inner work was all because she was trying to find somebody, right? Like I need to improve myself because, and we worked on that Mm -hmm. a lot because it's kind of what you're saying, you know, it's like, she had all of this stuff that she wanted to do and learn and grow and career and all these things. But for her, it was always about, well, when I'm at that next level, then I'm going to attract the kind of man that I want. And I think that I want to, I want to put it out there that everybody who's listening, there's a clarification here that the work is not to be done in order to find the work is to be done to be able to sit with yourself and be happy with yourself in that solitude. And I think, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think that that might be the difference between the solitude and the loneliness is that the loneliness comes from I'm doing this in order to find and the solitude comes from I'm happy that I'm doing this just because I'm doing this. Like it's, it's for me. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's chasing and attracting, right? right. So mm. yeah, one or something or attracting, I think attracting comes from solitude or some kind of inner journey. Mm-hmm. And I think chasing comes from um, a feeling of lack of, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that is such a, I was thinking that same thing before you said that Vanessa. And I think that is something that, is such a gift to the conversation that you've started, John. And what I think is so interesting is that it is so alive for women and women of a certain age feeling like I have like, what if my life doesn't ever have this partnership? And I'm sort of like waiting for this partnership for my life to begin. And I don't know. I, I mean, maybe you can speak to it as a man, John, but I don't experience that as much with men as I do with women that, you know, I'm nearing 40. Like if I don't get this, yeah. this done, I may never have a life. Right? Yeah. I, I think that's fair. I think part of that is society and, you know, the, 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 like the paintings that were painted before. And, and since we're, you know, in our thirties and forties, we we didn't grow up with internet. You know, we grew up with kind of the uh, uh, maybe the Norman Rockwell painting mm-hmm. and the picket mm-hmm. fence and what it means to be successful. And that includes a partner and kids and, you know, the matching BMWs or whatever. So part of it might be generational, um, but I think gender uh, for women, yeah, it's much harder than men. Yeah, I mean, I think biology, obviously, right, plays a role in that too. Well, women women are judged by their age. So like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, like if I get white hair, I get older, The you can argue, uh, what's the word that they use for men? They're distinguished. Yeah. Distinguished, yeah. right, things like that. And then when women get older, they're just old. We become or, invisible. Or, or whatever, right, yeah. Or, you know, and so that's got to be tremendously hard for, for women who are single. Right. And I think, you know, and and I, when I guess I meant biology, even in the sense of kids, right. Cause I mean, that is a real, that's a real drive for, you know, 
that it's definitely nothing to minimize for a lot of women. And I think that sometimes, at least in the work I've done with clients that are in their like mid to late thirties, a lot of the work around this, like this kind of urgency that they feel is, uh, is some grief work around mm. you know, what will it look like if that's not, if that's not what your life looks like, how are you going to sit in the grief of that? You know, letting yourself grieve this life that you thought you were going to have. So I think for a lot of women in my experience in that age, it's, it's grief. And then the inner work, I think, looks like that rediscovery of self, right? Like, who was I before society told me that what I should want for myself is the picket fence and the Norman Rockwell painting and the... Or, or, and I'm thinking about the same client I was just talking about, if you are somebody who's always wanted that ever since you were a little kid, which is also fine, right? Who are you if that's not the path that your life is going to take, right? Yeah. Can you take back the control and redefine, okay, you know, look, you're at this crossroads and now you get to choose what it looks like. And are you going to let this completely destroy your life at 37? Or are you going to kind of decide, no, in this moment, I'm going to, I'm going to redesign what my life can look like and still be happy. You know, it's hard. I think yeah. it's, I think oh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to say it's easy. It's so hard. I hear people talk about dating apps and I literally am like, no, thank you. Yeah. Like they talk about like, that people are like swiping at the table. I mean, obviously not right now, but they're like swiping at the table while they're on a date with you. And I'm like, oh my God, no wonder we needed this moment <laughs> to really look at ourselves. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, it's going to change. We'll see. But um, I, I, I mean, I think technology is great. I think we can use it to our advantage. I think there's something amazing about using your phone to connect with people. That's not going to go away. I think it's about just the intention and, and doing it in a way where um, it's showing people for who they are. It, basically, doing it in a way where you're not hiding. Mm. You know? So less filters, less, you know, all of that stuff. Oh, Should yeah. I have even seen that change even in like social media that I've witnessed in the last, I mean, not that I'm on it all that much, but you know, we've talked about how everybody's online right now doing a live, everybody's giving away free this, everyone's doing a free yoga session or a free fitness this or whatever. And even myself, I mean, the number of times I've done social media with like my hair a mess and like no makeup. Now granted, obviously I'm in like a crazy newborn haze, but I've seen that actually across the board. Like I have actually seen people who used to, or have always had this like very put together persona, like kind of out there a little bit more real and raw. And I don't know, maybe this is part of the trickle. Maybe the trickle is like, here it is. This is who I am. It's not the filtered and perfect and, you know, made up version of myself. I think generally Instagram is a beta, better dating app than like Tinder yeah. and all of those. Only because you can see hmm. history, you can see consistency. And so there's nothing wrong with having a beautiful photo. That's great, yeah. you know, and filtered and all that. But you could also see, you know, the person's dog and what they had to say and some writing. And so like going through, uh, like I, I scrolled the shit out of uh, Vanessa's Instagram when I met her because we met on a blind date. And I went through the whole thing, the, the, the Tinder, the, the other one, you get like three pictures in a, in like a paragraph bio. Mm -hmm. So you're getting the cardboard cut out, not the entire, the three dimensional, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and yes, on Instagram, people do front and all that stuff. But I think because their feeds are long, you can spot, you know, you could, you could spot it uh, quicker. But I do sense a little bit of some of the fear, like the people who I've heard people speak to this, like some of the people who are, would normally be a little hesitant to put themselves out there and allow themselves to be seen are doing things. Well, I mean, then some of this is survival, like people are having to do live videos because they're trying to like generate income at a time where it's not coming in anymore, but also just like really private people. I, I don't know. And if it's like a, a desire to connect. And so I'm putting myself out there and doing lives in that way, or I've always wanted to do this and I've been afraid before. And something about this moment is making me feel less afraid. I don't know. I think with you, it's a lot of a combination. Yeah. Cause I've seen your growth. I've seen you show yourself more, yeah. uh, start doing videos. Now you have a podcast uh, and it's all coming out naturally, but I think part of it is because you're on this journey of um, connecting with yourself, uh, going through, um, divorce, singlehood. Um, this is actually, I think, your way of coming out. Mm. Even though you're, right now you're in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> in a closet. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, thank you. And I think I, I really want to take this moment to give you a lot of credit for that, actually, John, because I feel like long before you were even dating my friend, a lot of your posts sort of spoke to that. And I still was really hesitant for a long time to sort of 
go after things that I felt like an urge to do or allow myself to be seen. And I think that when we allow ourselves to be seen, we sort of tell other people, you can do this. And there's a lot about your story that I would resonate with even before separation mm -hmm. and sort of felt like sure. I really resonate with what he's saying. No, thank you. The, your invoice is in the mail, but um, <laughs> thank you. Should we ask John the questions real quick? Lightning round? Yeah. Yeah, what breaks your heart? What breaks my heart? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my God, that's, that's, that's what you're going to start with? That's yeah. um, wasted talent. Mm. Yeah. That's good one. I love that. Yep. Don't die with the music still in you. I love that. What's our other one? Our other one is... Oh, you guys only have one? No. no. <laughs> oh, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> that's such a depressing question. You guys have that. <laughs> Um, what is in front of me, so I'm forgetting. <laughs> I think the second one was um, what flow do you state. How do you find your flow state? Oh, what is flow um, state? What is flow state? Yeah, yeah. Like? So when I think about flow state, I um, I, I, I think about uh, some of the happiest times of my life when I was 12 years old. Uh, fat laces, windbreaker, losing track of time, spinning on my head. So it's a physical activity that's creative. So for me, it's dropping into my body. So I, I, I feel like I tap into flow states a lot of times in fitness, on my motorcycle. It's usually an activity. Like when I was skateboarding, I would, you know, lose track of time and just be in it. That or like writing, something creative. What is your greatest hope in terms of what you are able to teach your daughter? Oh, to like herself. Mm -hmm. Not to love herself, I think uh, to like herself, to like yourself is a lot harder, you know. Mm. I agree. Mm. Well, on that Thanks. Note. Thanks, John. The whole time. <laughs> you guys go back to your little show, angel. Guys. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. you doing this with us. All right. All right, guys. We hope you enjoyed. And, um... <laughs> All right, be All guys, guys. Be well, bye. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Cheaper Than Therapy. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to connect with us, you can find us on Instagram at Vanessa S. Bennett and at Danae Logan Selkin.